Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at the Skywatcher EvoStar ED100, a 4-inch F9 apochromatic refractor optical tube assembly. Now the 100 is the middle model in the EvoStar line, which includes the 80 and the 120. I've previously known this telescope as the Orion ED100. It was available in their catalog for several years in a gray tube. I've seen a few of those and I've always liked them, but I've never had one in for long-term review until now. This telescope finished in Skywatcher's signature black tube with the gold flex in it. I've always liked this design. It's a bit of a change from the generic white and black that you see out here. $950 buys you the optical tube, and it's a lot of money, but you do get uh, quite a bit with it. This telescope comes unusually well appointed for something advertising itself as an optical tube assembly only. In addition to the telescope, you get rings and a plate, 5 millimeter and 25 millimeter eyepieces that I think are a cut above some of these throwaways that you get with other telescopes. You get an 8x50 right angle finder, a 2 inch dielectric diagonal, very nice touch there and fit it into a two inch, two speed Crayford focuser. All of this comes in a foam fitted carrying case made of aluminum. Now I'm mentally adding up all of the accessories here and I'm coming up with a number if you were to go out and buy all of this stuff by yourself, somewhere in the 300 to $350 range conservatively. So you're getting the telescope, I think at a very attractive price and I'm half tempted to say, well, if this thing even throws up a half decent image, this is a bargain. How do they do this? Well, the telescope makes no effort to hide its origins. There's a sticker right on the end of the tube that says, made in China. Anyhow, let's get this thing up on a mount and see how it looks. And here we are with the telescope mounted. Skywatcher lists the optical tube at 8.4 pounds, outfitted the way you see here with all of their equipment on it, including their 25 millimeter eyepiece. I measure at 10.6 pounds. This is light for its class. As such, it will go on any number of mid-size mounts, including this CG5 you see on the end here, and Skywatcher's own HE5 Q series. This mount is also known as a Sirius for those of you who speak Orion. Now, when this telescope first got to me, I immediately noticed that there was something wrong with it. The focuser was way too loose. It wasn't holding like this. In fact, if I had put the telescope up on a mount like this, pointed up in the air, the focuser would eventually start to creep out on its own and no amount of turning this knob would move it in and out. Upon inspecting the underside of this Crayford style focuser, I noticed one of its six hex head screws was missing. So I looked inside the case here and I found it hiding in the corner I put the hex head screw back in and it still wasn't tight enough. Now I don't know how prevalent this problem is. From time to time on these inexpensive Crayford style focusers, I have noticed that the tension may not come set totally correctly out of the factory. They're either too tight or they're too loose. Most of the time, if there's an error, they are a little bit too loose. Now every one of these adjusts a different way. Now at one point, Orion did sell this focuser as an accessory in their catalog, and there is an instruction manual available online. I'll leave a link in the description so you can take a look at it yourself. It doesn't say much, I wish it had some pictures in it, but it does describe how to adjust this focuser. So I'll show you how I fix this. Let's take a look at the bottom side of the focuser, and you'll notice this complicated looking arrangement of screws. It's actually not so bad once you study it a little bit. There are six Allen head screws around the outside. Those are hex head screws and those are two millimeter screws. On the inside, there are two larger recessed head screws. Those are 2.5 millimeters. Now in a focuser, if things are too loose, there may be an inclination for you to go in there and tighten everything down, but that's actually the wrong thing to do. There's a reason that those two screws in the middle are a different size and they are a different type of screw than the ones on the outside. It's not a matter of tightening or loosening them all. They are actually a push-pull arrangement. You push on one set of the screws, you pull on the other set of screws or vice versa. Alternately, you can push and pull just on those two larger screws in the middle and sometimes that will work. So the upshot of all this, with the tension adjusted, 
I can take this eyepiece. This is a 26 millimeter type 5 Nagler. This eyepiece alone weighs 1.6 pounds, and as you can see, there is no difficulty in racking this focuser in and out. What a gorgeous December day. Not too cold. What should we do? Go for a hike? Go for a walk in the woods? Go for a bike ride? Nah. Let's look at a telescope. There it is, the Skywatcher Evo Star 100 ED on the Skywatcher HEQ 5 Series mount. Got the lens here. Nice deep dark green coatings. The tube is baffled, as is the draw tube. That's SINSCAN 4 in the module. I've got that updated to the latest version, which I believe is 4.39.15. Uh, I don't care for right angle finders myself, but if that's your thing, by all means go for it. Um, you know what? I might just leave this thing set up. It's pointed in the right direction. Wait until it gets dark, and let's see how it performs. We're back after several days of observing and imaging, and it's good. The star test on this particular telescope I thought was very good. It may be slightly better than the quarter wave under correction diagram in Souter's book. This is a fairly common result for a star test. Planets looking quite fine. Mars is just past opposition, but it is very high up in the sky, and putting a lot of power on it at a good night makes it look quite good. Saturn and Jupiter, Fading off to the west, but again, under good conditions, Cassini's division, four moons of Jupiter and several moons on Saturn, easy to catch. As far as double stars go, Delta Cygnus is commonly taken to be a good test for a 4-inch. No problem here with a 7mm Nagler at about 126 power, both components are easily seen. Eta Cassiopeia with its striking color difference, quite pleasing. If you're in that area, check out Iota Cassiopeia. Yes, I know Ada gets all of the publicity in that part of the sky, but try Iota. I think it's an even better looking double. There's three of them, first of all, and second of all, they all look different and they're in this sort of tight little configuration. Check it out, see what you think. For deep sky within the confines of a four inch telescope, very pleasing views indeed, M42, uh, M45, that's the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy is M31, and star clusters in Auriga, M37, M36, and M38. You know, the list goes on and on. You could see a lot of things with a 4-inch telescope. Now, one ability of a good 4-inch refractor that isn't talked about a lot is the star clusters. Many of them are bright, and no two of them look the same. I direct your attention, if you're in the Monoceros area, to NGC 2301. Things in space have a tendency to kind of want to be round or spherical. Not this cluster. You've got a bunch of stars kind of all in a line. Looks like a conga line of stars. Check that one out. You know, one night I was out observing all alone. Saturn and Jupiter are pretty low in the sky, so I have to get on top of this hill to see them. And it was just an extraordinary night. Uh, even though the planets were near the horizon, it didn't matter. The air was so steady. It almost seemed like I couldn't put enough power on this thing. This thing was just soaking up magnification like a sponge. And it just looked sharp no matter what I did. Now, fortunately, I had my planetary imaging gear with me. And I set it up. And as soon as I started to take a picture, my battery died. I have an old Celestron power tank. It's my fault. I've known for a while this thing was on the fritz, but it chose just that moment to die on me. Now, I was alone up on this hill, didn't have anybody with me who could watch my equipment, and I was only two and a half miles from home, but I didn't feel right leaving all that equipment set up. So what did I do? I broke everything down. I put it in the car. I drove home. I got another battery. I drove back to the hill, put everything back together, initialized my imaging gear, and what do you know, in the time that I've been gone, the seeing had gone downhill by a little bit. Still very good, but it wasn't quite the magical moment that I had before. Now, I did manage to get these three images of Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. There they are, east to west, with a Teleview 2X Barlow. Now, the system's operating at F18 at this point, which isn't ideal. But still, I think I'm proud of this image. 
Now, why do I tell that story? Well, while I was back home for those few minutes, the Takahashi FS-102 was sitting right there. I could have taken it. But, you know, subconsciously, I think I knew that this thing was going to be just fine, and it was. If you're interested in imaging, no complaints here. I had some people ask me, at F9, is it getting a little bit slow? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I had to increase my exposure times versus something faster to get the same result. And of course, as you increase your exposure time, noise creeps in, and the longer the shutters open, the more chances you have for bad things to happen. And if you've noticed, the only change I've made to this telescope is as I have removed that green bar and put this longer one underneath it because I wanted to mount an auto guider underneath. Now, I did use this generic field flattener. This one is about $150. It's labeled AstroTech. Uh, it's okay. I've described this before. It does have a tendency to vignette. Uh, there is some distortion in the corners, and it has a tendency to put up some internal reflections. I'm not complaining at $150. It's definitely worth what I paid for it. Unfortunately, the only other field flatteners I have are my expensive ones from Takahashi, and those tend to be keyed towards the individual model that they are designed for. You can't use them on anything else. I don't have a mid-range field flattener right now. People tell me that the Teleview units work very well. I don't doubt that. I just don't have one right now. Maybe I should remedy that. So really, there isn't much to say. I don't have much in the way of criticism here. The early mishap with the focuser, perhaps. It never gave me any trouble after I adjusted it. But here it is in comparison with some other more expensive apochromatic refractors. That's the Takahashi FS-102 here and the AstroTech A115EDT. Keep in mind the Skywatcher is by far the least expensive of all of these. Visually, from where you're standing, it probably holds its place very well. What you don't see, and you have to kind of be sitting where I am to notice this, is the build quality. These other telescopes, the Takahashi in particular, are built like fine jewelry. Uh, racking the focuser in and out is just such a beautiful, silky smooth tactile experience. Uh, the two-speed focuser on the AstroTech is definitely superior than the Crayford-style focuser here. And in general, the construction quality on this one, is, I would describe as more workmanlike blue collar, if you will. There's nothing wrong with it, uh, but it's not quite the extra exquisite finish that you find on a really nice refractor like a Takahashi or an Astrophysics. I'm trying to find something to say about this. There's some minor niggles that I might want to point out with the Skywatcher Evo Star 100 ED. The visual back, that what terminates on the back of the focuser, is not a compression ring. It is two set screws, so it will mar whatever you place inside the focuser. The focuser itself is also not rotatable. Some people might be bothered by that if they're doing imaging. Uh, the dew shield is not retractable. Uh, not a huge deal for me. Some people are worried about those things. The, ta the Takahashi's dew shield, also not retractable. Uh, the dust cap is a piece of thin plastic. Um, you know, I'm kind of scraping the barrel here, and I don't know how sportsmanlike it is for me to complain about this at this price point for all that you're getting. But I thought it's worth mentioning nonetheless. And while we're talking about little niggling complaints, that 5 millimeter eyepiece Ooh, just a little bit strong, just a little bit aggressive at 180 power. I can't go that high most of the time where I am. I would use my 7 millimeter Nagler at 126 power, and I have a 6 millimeter eyepiece that goes a little bit higher. That 5, I didn't really have a lot of chances to use. And there you have it, a nice 4-inch apochromatic refractor. Is this right for you? Well, if what you want to do is in line with what a good 4-inch apochromatic refractor does, you don't want to pay an arm and a leg, you don't want to sit years on a waiting list, yeah, this is fine, go for it. The product is fine. As long as it fits your lifestyle and your observing style, that's going to be the telescope for you. 
if you're just starting out, yeah, maybe a little bit low on the aperture side and the cost. I mean, you've got a thousand here, you budget another thousand for a mount. That's a decent chunk of change. And again, if you're just starting out, if you're a beginner, I still might lean you towards something like an eight inch Dobsonian reflector. It gathers four times as much light and you get the entire telescope for around $400. But if this is what you really want, yeah, go ahead, go for it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Hey, you know what I was thinking? Doesn't this look really cool with these three refractors sitting on this desk? I mean, I got FS-102, the Skywatcher, the AstroTech 115. You know, I've always wanted an FS-128. That's the five inch version of this Takahashi. And they do make a 120 millimeter version of the Evo Star. And I know they make a 130 millimeter version of this AstroTech. In fact, there's one in the club. I wonder if he'd sell it to me. If I could get all three of those, line them up all here. I'd have six of them on this desk instead of three. No more telescope. But no more telescope. These aren't mine.